Oh, look at this. You see, we're live. Live. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to see the little people in the eyeball start rolling in. Give them a bit of time. Our friends in the Facebook family are welcome tonight for the first time. You're the first person that we go live with on Facebook. It's the first time. Yeah, so we're going to give you like a plaque. We'll send you a plaque. First Milan Weekly Podcast on uh, on Facebook. First uh, Milan Weekly Podcast with an Inter fan. <laughs> no, you're not the first. You're not the first. No, on Facebook. On Facebook. On Facebook, yeah. You're going to be the first. <laughs> We had uh, we have Francis, we have the guys of uh, sempreinter.com, uh, we have them all, and uh, that's yeah. the those are the best ones because we just go at it, we go head to head, and that's it. Me, I'm uh, I'm sportive. I'm uh, very uh, I'm very neutral when it comes to sports. So. Imagine everybody is. So we have uh, Francis is very very sport sportive that you know, but uh, he busts balls. He knows how to push your buttons. But the guys are sempreinter.com. They're they're really like very cool. We have uh, good conversations, very good conversations. Good. So it's always, always good to hear. Yeah. Okay, so let's start there. I'm gonna start it off, and then after we'll yeah. take it from there. So no I'm problem. gonna say I'm gonna say what my friend Vince says all the time. Guys, we're live. Welcome to a special edition of the Milan Weekly Podcast with my dear friend. Rocco Placentino, technical director of Club de Soccer Celera. Hi everyone. Hi Steve. Rocco. Uh, hope all is well. Everything is well. Thank you, everybody. And again, like if you didn't hear it before, you're hearing it again now. This is the first time Milan Weekly Podcast is being simultaneously streamed on YouTube and Facebook Live. So uh, for everybody's viewing pleasure. Uh, I have the privilege, and it's it's seriously like it's my honor there, Rocco, because uh, I'll give everybody a little bit of context. Uh, I grew up playing soccer with Rocco. We actually started in the same team, very young, and then they found out that he's younger, so he magically disappeared from my team, and he went to the to to, the, to his actual age group. So imagine he was playing with older kids and dominating when we were very young. And uh, and he and he actually went on to his age group and and, and dominated there and uh, and we both played in the same club CSRDP. I, I'm proud of this 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 man here. He's not a kid anymore. He's a man who who took uh, who took his local career and brought it again to the limit. Right, uh, being able to play for his hometown team, being able to play in Europe, and we'll get into that in the podcast there as we go on with Rocco there. So thank you, Rocco, for saying yes to Milan Weekly Podcast. Uh, for sure. A pleasure, man. Always a pleasure to talk to old friends. Nice. Good stuff. Rocco, we'll start with this. I want to know uh, your experience as a player at, at that club level. So now, now you're back in the, in the club level as a technical director. But take everybody back uh, through your journey from playing club soccer and then... Uh, Obviously, uh, you were part of the Quebec Select program and then the Canadian National program. If you can tell just everybody a little bit of your background on that local level. Yeah, well, um, I grew up in the hood of uh, Riviere de Piri. What's up? Uh, you know, uh, what's up, bro? <laughs> but, uh, you know, we uh, had some very, very special players uh, that went through that club back in the day. Um, you know, I'm a 1982, but... If we go scroll down all the way to 1977, you know, my brother's era, uh, era 78, 79, Dave Zafino era, so uh, Nick Danello. So, there, you know, there was a lot of talent in RDP. I'm sure there still is. Uh, RDP always uh, has talent. Um, and, yeah, but, you know, uh, it was uh, father coaching, uh, the slaps across the face. Uh, but, uh, you know what, we we... I was lucky. I had, you know, older guys like you. You guys were a year older than me. Then I had my brother and his friends. So I was put in an atmosphere of um, a very competitive group. I think that uh, uh, that competitive mentality that that grew up uh, into my into who I am today is thanks to a lot of those guys that I grew up with in the hood. Um, and then, yeah, you know, uh, Quebec Select teams, uh, national C CNHP program, uh, national team, and. I did all the steps. Every every step I had to do, I did, and I, I must say, 
as a player living it uh, over 25 years ago, um, it's a lot different today. A lot more avenues today for more practices, more qualified coaches, not because the coaches weren't good back then. Uh, they were they were very good, but they were uh, without levels. They just it's just it was in their blood, right? And uh, now it's a lot more structured. And I think kids today are very fortunate to be part of a, of any club, whatever club they play with uh, in in the province to to have technical directors, to have a general manager, to have uh, paid coaches and turf fields and indoor turf fields. These are all things that uh, I'm sure you remember, Steve. When we were kids, we used to play on uh, in the arenas, right? Yeah, and uh, the grass was burnt and the grass was hard. Uh, we didn't have turf, and so today, you know, you could say that kids have it on a um, on a silver platter. And uh, sometimes I find that they take it for granted. Um, but that's that's being a kid, right? That's they they don't know better. Um, it's for us. It's for us to educate them, uh, just like just like teachers do in school, while we're teachers on the field. So uh, whatever I learned as a player. Forget about being as a professional soccer player, but whatever I learned as an amateur soccer player when I was a kid, I still brought some of those values with me, and I try and transmit it to my coaches and to my players today. Yeah, and that's that's important. You touched on uh, on a subject that I wanted to I wanted to hit as well. So we know that uh, you know when we grew up, we were playing in the back of uh, of a hockey arena, Rene Masson, where you know kids now they say, oh, you know, we're gonna play on turf kids when we played on turf it was not turf you know and i said the same thing when i when when we spoke with jason turf back when we were uh, when we were kids was concrete uh and with a a, a a green a slightly green painted on uh carpet that was full of salt astro turf astro turf exactly so you slid it burned like a mother You, uh, <laughs> when it rained, you slid. There was no cleat. There was no turf shoe that was going to save you. So ankles, knees, that was a tremendous uh, on, on everybody's body. Uh, so what, what are the kids, what are the kids reaction when, um, uh, something, uh, something like this happened in terms of where they're, they're not. They're not able to go through their their regular routine. Something takes them out of this uh, out of this norm where they're practicing three four times a day. And now I know it's something very un or un unrealistic, and hopefully it will not happen in our lifetime again. But what's their reaction? What was their reaction when you had to tell the kids, "Look, we can't practice three times a, a week anymore." Look. Um... It's it's a very good question. I, I think that you know kids today they 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 have a lot of training. They get you know a couple hours a week. Um, I'll use a, a little stupid example where uh, last year uh, you know in Saint they built a beautiful uh, grass field, top notch, brand new with a sprinkler system. It was fenced, and the reason was because you know uh, the club grew, so they, we needed more soccer fields, and and we have a lot of AAA teams, so. When we would tell some of our AAA teams, yeah, some of your games and your practice are going to be on the new grass field. And they were like, grass? What do you mean grass? And because they're so used to this new turf where it's a, it's like a sponge, it has the little black rubber. So, you know, your your knee gives in, your ankles give in, everything is good. It wasn't like the actual turf where how many people broke their knees. I know people still today break their knees on turf, but back in the day, I think the ratio was a lot higher. Um, and then, yeah, like now we come to, Uh, these uh, unfortunate circumstances that we're in for the last uh, um, almost three months. And yeah, kids are like, when we go back, it's it's not going to be three, four times a week, you know, because we have no choice to just gradually come into it, you know. And, and they they have trouble understanding that, you know. It's, uh, it's again, they're very, um, they're fortunate. They've been living in a, in a world where, You know, like I said, a lot of hours of soccer, brand new turf, indoor facilities. So when that all gets taken away from them, from them, it's like, hey, what's happening here? You know, so it's and and this is the problem. It's it's trying to keep, because they're so used to this luxury, right? Um, now it's like we took it away from them, not on purpose, of course, and they some of them kind of lost their motivation. So it's it's for us to like try and you know. 
restart uh, the car and and get and get and, these kids motivated because it's tough. It's and tough. get and get the engine motivating. Like you know, uh, yeah. I, I you're a father. I'm a father. We see it. Our kids are creatures of habit, right? So them, they were in the habit that everything was perfect all the time. The turf was perfect. The hours were perfect. The practices were perfect. This is the world that we lived. Back in our day, sometimes your dad could not take you to practice. You had to find a way to get to practice. And, and, and this is where times have changed. And I tried to explain it to my kids and hopefully they'll go through their head. Times have changed. I remember going to practice with uh, my friend's father. Uh, someone else would bring me back home. I would take my bike. I would take the bus. It's not, it's not real life anymore, right? Uh, parents are not going to take that chance. And you touched on something where they lost some motivation. So what I want to go to now is your motivation and what it took for you to leave Canada and go play soccer in Europe. I want to know about that motivation. Um, it's a very good question. For me, my motivation was, uh, was just to never give up, right? Um, uh, a lot of people would say, it's never going to happen. Where are you going? And I love that. For me, I, I love that challenge, right? It was, and I didn't, I didn't leave because of, of the the haters or the jealousy. I left because I, I, I really thought that I had a chance, you know. And and um, I'm not gonna lie, the first two years were extremely, extremely difficult. Um, being away from family, friends, siblings, you know, uh, your your family. It's a, it's your life. So you're leaving your life to start a new life, basically, by yourself. Because I was literally by myself, and then I went to a um, into a country where uh, in Italy, uh, when yes, I'm Italian, but I'm Can to them I'm Canadian, right? So uh, you're a foreigner. A yeah, so you're when a you, foreigner. When you get it when, when uh, a Canadian get, gets into uh, from Quebec gets into Italy, and they say ma ma che calcio c'è in Canada? Là ci stanno i pinguini. They don't take you serious. So. Not only they don't take you serious, but now there's a, a Canadian boy that's here to steal one of our Italian spots. You understand? So the first two years, it was, uh, you know, a lot of uh, just looking straight forward, not making anything bother me. A lot of sleepless nights, a lot of crying nights for sure. Uh, but uh, I, uh, you know what? I was lucky. I had my, my parents, um, my sister, my brother. Um, they... They kept me strong. Sometimes my mom, I would tell her, okay, ma, stop crying. I'm not going to speak to you anymore. But uh, but uh, if it wasn't for my family, uh, you know, they were that extra push. And I have to say that even my 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 family, like my family tree with cousins and siblings and all that stuff, they they really helped me uh, the, the for the first couple of years to, to just get through that, that rough patch because it's all a mental game. It's not about talent. It's not about sacrifice because you're already there with your talent and you're already there to sacrifice. It's mentally, are you strong enough to stay away from who you love, you know, and and stay away from going out with your friends and getting cracked until four in the morning? And I had to sacrifice all that the, that time. I made up for it. Uh, it. Yeah, I made up for it in the future, but um, you know, it was uh, it was tough. It was very very tough. And that's something that you know that uh, it's great that to see someone like you who's gone through that experience and now being technical director at uh, at Saint Laurent, where you can pass on these these types of in your time there was not many people that could have give you that strong advice right you 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 no. were going you were going into this really blind listening to uh, I'm sure your parents and an agent and someone who's representing you in Italy and and what and actually actually walking into the jungle right basically because like you said as much as we're we feel and i i look at me look i, I don't even know how to turn in the camera i wear italy every day i watch italian soccer I, I i speak italian it was my mother tongue because my parents came here and that was my first language uh when i go back to italy or when we go back to italy whether we like it or not and it's a kick to the gut we are not Italian. We become stranieri and we become someone who's there to take someone's spot, which is someone who's going to be able, who's going to probably get out of a more difficult situation than you're in. And 
that's him providing for his family, maybe putting food on the table for his family in the future. It's it's a dog eat dog world, right? So, uh, yeah. and and I remember having conversations with some some other of my friends where uh, they would say, "Oh, my cousin, he's leaving and he's going to Argentina." And and I would think and stop thinking to myself, and I'm nowhere a professional, and nowhere uh, nor did I ever go and play professional. But I love the game, and I watch the game, and I read a lot about the game. A and you see all these documentaries of people that are going. You're one from Canada, but there's one from one from Argentina. There's one from Ghana who's coming. Where these people at 14, 15 years old are adults already. It's a different yeah. world. And our kids don't understand that until someone like you explains it to them that to make it professionally, the talent is because someone saw you already. Now it's, are you a grown man? Do you have the mental power to become a professional? So it's, it, it, you, you know what? It's, uh, it's funny you say that because I, I do use uh, a lot of, my, uh, I say, my history um, with my players. And in Saint Laurent, uh, we have over 160 different races, whether you're African, whether you're from Mexico, whether you're from Greece, it's, it's, it's beautiful to, to witness because Amazing. On, one on one team, I could have over 12 or 13 or 15 nationalities. And so they love hearing my stories. They want to be my story. And I encourage them to be my story and uh, you know it's and it's all about again it, it's a mindset it's if you don't have that worry mentality of of saying you know what I'm gonna leave 16 years old 15 years whatever it is I'm gonna leave and I gotta make sure that I'm leaving because I want to prove the ones that think I can't make it wrong I want to prove my family that I'm I'm growing up I'm a young man or a young girl uh, in the world. And I want to, ex you know, express myself and my values and my talent to another piece of the world. And again, remember, we're Canadian. When you're Argentinian and you're going to Italy, okay, you know, it's an Argentinian soccer player, yeah. you know. But but I I, I think that that it's it's um, being Canadian is it's even harder, you know. Yeah. Like now, like Alfonso Davies, uh, he's being rated the best center at left back in the world. The kid is, he, he's Canadian. People say, no, no, he's from Ivory No, no, no. The no, 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 he's Canadian. Canadian. The, kid, the kid decided to play for Team Canada. So the, I always say it, man. Kids should be dreaming. They have to dream. They have to say, I want to be a professional soccer player. My only thing is baby steps. You cannot go from being an amateur soccer player to go play for AC Milan. You got to be an amateur soccer player and you gotta work your tail off and and grind and sacrifice and and don't look back and just keep on forward going forward and then luck comes into play your agent comes into play money comes into play there's a lot of different steps before you like for myself when i was in italy i did eight years and the first two years i have to find myself you know like it, because not everybody could play in first division or second division it's 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 there's there's 12 divisions in Italy yeah. and there's so many players that don't make it. So I found my groove in third division and, and you know what? I would get paid more playing in third division than going to play for a team in Serie B that would give me half the money because I'm in Serie B. But at, at 24, 25 years old, I was, you know what? I made a name for myself in Serie G. So I said, you know what? Now people don't know me as Canadese. Now people know me as Italo Canadese. You understand? So, it was fun. I, I, my last, my last five, five, five years in Italy were, I didn't feel like a foreigner. You know, the first two years, yes, but after that, I, I would go back in the summer and I felt like I was one of them. But it took a lot of work. Like it didn't just happen. You know, so yeah. it's. So, so you said something very interesting there. You said baby steps. My my favorite uh, line is, especially talking about Milan and talking about anything Serie A, is manager expectations, right? So as someone who's played, and we won't stay on this too long there, I want to switch to another topic, but I think it's a very important question for anybody that's uh, that's listening that has kids, including myself. And I think I've been around, you know, uh, people like yourself and Jason, not very frequently, but followed your story and, and have intelligent friends that, you know, 
the kid needs to want to do what he wants to do. He, it's important that he dreams, not the parents dream. Uh, what's your advice to a, to a, to a young kid who, who's thinking about making this jump, not only to the young kid, but his family too, like talking about a dad or a mom or, uh, uh, and, and not only a boy, a girl, like a, a mother, uh, uh, anybody in this family, what's your advice to them, Rocco? You know, I, I think uh, coming back to saying baby steps, parents and, and kids should dream. And if they have this talent, they should explore this talent. But when I say baby steps, it, it means don't be shy to ask a guy like Rocco Placentino, Jason Itulio, Sandro Grande, Antonio Ribeiro, Ali Jerba. Don't be afraid to ask us what, what, what it takes or what's the sacrifice or how do we do it? We, we could only, it would be, for me, it's a pleasure to tell kids and parents my story or Sandro's story or whoever it is, because there's a lot of us that played overseas or even with the impact that that matter. So it's, 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 it's believing yourself, but in baby steps, you're not going to, you're not going to go from playing with RDP to playing with uh, Juve. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not, it's just not realistic. You could dream, but make it a realistic dream. So there's so many players that, even Steve, when we were younger, that had super talent, more than us, but they didn't succeed because they didn't have the mental aspect on taking those baby steps to achieve uh, the professional goal, you know? Yeah. I, I agree. I agree. And, and and for me, you know, like coaching and seeing my, my, my son's team and, and being involved, uh, not as much as I'd like to, but uh, maybe in the future a little bit more. Uh, I want I want to be able to give that message and not make people think that it, I'm either being a hater or jealous. It's just because I had the opportunity to talk to someone like you talk to someone like Jason, play with someone like Ali Jurba for a short period of time. Uh, you know, it, it's it's just that I want people to understand that our parents made us dream. They Probably didn't time. dream. They didn't dream for us because if anything, they were the complete opposite, Rocco. They were the 100%. ones. Who, you know, my father. You think he didn't tell me, ma Steve, ma tu mangi troppo? Come vuoi giocare un pallone? He, he would tell me the honest truth. You're not in shape. You're not going to make it. And he, and he was being honest with me. And that's what we need. We need we need honesty, and we need to be we need to get away from this this keyboard and social media mentality where we cannot tell people the truth. We need to be able to tell these kids the truth to maybe avoid them making a mistake, not to put them down, just avoid them making a terrible mistake. So what I, I want to go ahead. Go ahead. I, I just went by saying is is yes, a lot of times I feel that it's parents that are dreaming more than the kids, that the parents dream more than the kids dream. And yes, that plays a big part on a negative uh, side for a kid because they, they become weak, you understand? Because they don't know that they're really not at that level, but their parents are making them believe that they are, you understand? So yeah, honesty is the best policy, that's for sure. Uh, we have, we're gonna before we're gonna break this one and we're gonna take a question there from uh, YouTube. We have uh, Gigi yeah. La Patate. One, who's uh, he wants to know how did Alfonso Davies at 19 go to MLS and then Bayern Munich? Was he lucky? So uh, Davies, uh, from the age of 14, 15, they knew that he was going to be something special. Um, when he was in Vancouver, they knew that they were going to sell him. Before uh, Bayern Munich, um, there was Manu, Liverpool. There was other clubs that he was supposed to go train with. And the coach of Vancouver said, ah, you know, he's not ready. He's not ready. Once they got rid of that, during that, the, 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 the coach was uh, Carl Robertson, okay? And uh, during that moment, his agent said, we have an opportunity here. And they wanted him. They liked this. They, they, they saw that he was something that they could have made something very special out of. And in a matter of a year and a half, uh, he's being rated best left back in the world. It's phenomenal. That's it's that's phenomenal. amazing, amazing, and you know. So there's no luck there. Yeah, no, not not luck, and and you see with someone like that, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be on this podcast and say that I followed Alfonso Davies' his whole career, but watching the games against the uh, you know let's say Impact playing against Vancouver and just seeing hey this guy seems to have another gear that maybe the other yeah, guys yeah, don't yeah. right so yeah. uh, and you know what in the game today speed kills. So uh, he has that that humongous gear 
where he can turn it on and turn it off. And sometimes it doesn't even look like he's putting in an effort, but he's going it's so crazy. fast. It's crazy. Uh, and I've had the opportunity now because I'm not a big Bundesliga fan, but with Bundesliga being the only league, uh, I tuned in to the Bayern Munich games, right? And that, that's where they got everybody. And I, I'm looking at these guys like, I, I'm so proud that this guy's Canadian. Like, because, wow. like you said, you know, like everybody refers to us as a hockey country. We're now producing soccer talent, right? And and I'm pretty sure there's other ones that are hiding in the in the in the in the mist just to just to get that that just that exposure where they're gonna pop out too, right? So, um, I want to go to something that is 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 as I know that's a it's a passion of yours, and and I want you to talk about it. I want to know. What led you to the technical director role? Um, you know what? In my in my last years of soccer as a player, uh, even when I was with the Impact in 2009, I did an, an interview with the Radio Canada, and, and I told him that when I finished playing soccer, this is what I like. I want to be a, a technical director. You know, it, it's uh, Steve. I'm only good at this stuff. <laughs> like I, I'm a <laughs> soccer guy. Uh, don't tell me to pull it up this light bulb. It's my no. house. I put it up. Uh, I'll cut the grass. I'll do the dishes. But this is this is my life. Like I, like I'll go to a U fourteen A game, a girls U fourteen A game. We'll score, and I'll celebrate like I scored the goal with my veins popping out of my. Like it's just, I I, I love my job. The only person that hates my job is my wife, um, because the hours are uh, ridiculous. Um, but in life, they say you got to do what you got to do, right? And and for me, uh, I, I adore my job. I love it. Technical director, Rocco. So we know we, 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 you've spoken to Jason in the past on Instagram Live and your conversations between technical director and coach. Uh, I have friends who are now coaching their daughters, you know, in Laval. Uh, he's on right now. He's going to be so happy that I mentioned him. Vince Catuzzo, he teaches, oh, he Vince. coaches Great his coach. daughter. I Great him coach. coach. I'm so I proud of him, him because he's actually listening and he's actually teaching these girls how to play soccer the proper way. Uh, yes. For me, for me, what, what, uh, what irritated me the most during my 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 time uh, just watching other coaches, and it's not, and it's going to probably sound. It's going to probably sound a little bit condescending there, but I believe that you as a technical director, your job is as a teacher to teach these coaches how to coach. And and that's such an important role because not only do you have to listen to, maybe they might have a better idea than you, but also be able to pass on your message without being condescending because let's face it Rocco we're not going to we're not going to advance as a soccer country if our coaches are making the teams play soccer baseball um it's um, a very good question Steve and I, I just want to start by saying Jason uh for me his soccer knowledge is through the roof uh I uh, every time I speak soccer with him I get excited cuz he's he's just amazing um, but his role, like he wants to be a coach, right? He wants to be a, a coach. He wants to be a professional coach. And I think that he will achieve that because not because he's my friend, but, or our friend, I just really think he has it in him. That's my opinion. Um, a TD, a uh, technical director, their job is not to be on the field, micromanaging and coaching every team. That's not their job. Their job and the way I do it and everybody has a way, um, is to educate your coaches to educate your players, to educate your your parents, showing that you're always involved with, whether it's house league or AAA, that you're always around. And I treat our club like a family. For me, uh, I I love, like I let my coaches coach. They, they have uh, principles of play. They have things that they need to follow. But I, because I, a coach, and, and, you know, you mentioned Vince. I've seen Vince coach uh, against uh, uh, my uh, girls' team, and they always kill us. Uh, they have a very strong team, but it's not – they have a they have some special players on the team uh, that I've seen, but they, they Vince is there. You could tell that he's there to, to, to coach them the right way, not just kicking the ball and playing the ball. And it's, it's, it's important to surround your – a tech run director, it's important for him or her – to surround themselves with a good staff, with a good board, and with a good 
uh, atmosphere of coaches and parents. It's super difficult, eh? Because it's amateur sports and there's politics that come into play. There's uh, there's so many different um, uh, fires that us PDs have to put out during a year. And uh, but it's it's the name of the game. It's not a professional club. It's an it's an amateur club. So there's always problems. Always. Yeah. And that's uh, that's an important uh, role that you said uh, uh, educating the coaches. Can you can you talk a bit about uh, someone who wants to start coaching? And uh, let's say take an example of uh, let's say myself. Uh, I'm coaching right now. Uh, uh, my son's U16, and I, I wanna I wanna go forward with this coaching. What are the different licenses and levels that Canada wants you to get to to be able to coach at different levels as your son, if he decides to progress in soccer or not? Or you as a coach, as a, as let's say a project for yourself. What do I need to do to get to to let's say for us it's that triple A level. We'll forget about the UEFA licenses and all that stuff. We don't want to go there. But what does a coach have to do in terms of levels to be able to at least get that paperwork for him to continue to coach? So, so that's uh, look. It's 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 very simple. When I finished playing pro. Uh, we got our levels granted, right? Because you played pro, so we got our we we bypassed everything. But uh, there was one of the levels called so basically there's S2, S3, S7, uh, Theory A, Theory B. Those are the minimal ones. Those are just sports educational programs. Then once you get into license C, that's soccer related. Um, license DFP, uh, which is the USP. That's you know higher. Then you have your B provincial. Then you have your B national. Then you have your A, uh, your A national. So there's they're like I'm at my B national. I stop right now. I'm at B national because that's all I need for now. You know, um, but just to say that just because I played soccer for 12 years, it doesn't mean that I was I was gonna be or I am a good TD. It doesn't mean that at all. I admire taking those courses like the day pay. I didn't have to take the pay, but Valerio Godzola. So no, Rocco, take it. You're gonna you're gonna need it. And I had Val as one of my first coaches as a as a pro, and I always listened to him because I was scared shitless of him. Uh, so uh, I took that DFP course, uh, and it was him that gave it, and Mike Vitalano. And we know Mike. Mike, we grew up with him, right? Yeah. Mike and is Mike is a Milanista. Uh, Mike is a Milanista. I, I was given yeah. his contact information. If Mike is listening, we're gonna call Mike next after, not right after this, because I need to. I need to spend time with my wife, or she's gonna kill me. But he will be a future guest. So um, these guys, uh, honestly, Steve, I uh, I am so uh, privileged and honored to have learned from them. Uh, they are like. Val is he's been around for for a uh, hundred years, uh, and you could always learn from him. Always, 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 always. Uh, and Mike is is just like I have a problem. Uh, the first person I think about is Mike. Like I call Mike, I speak to Mike, and I think that the federation having a guy like Mike Vitolano, uh, they're very fortunate, and uh, they should take you know take him very seriously because he he is uh by far in in the amateur soccer world i think he's in in our province we're the, we're very 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 fortunate to have him very fortunate and uh so taking the levels is extremely important so when i took the dfa when i went from my b provincial and my b national the information that i learned was amazing amazing so these are all levels that whether you played soccer or didn't play soccer, you need to educate yourself before you could educate others. And that's an amazing point, and that's why I wanted to bring it up. It was kind of a loaded question for me because you know a lot of uh, I I speak to uh, a lot of guys and they want to take their, their their licenses and is it worth it? Is it a money grab? And I said, guys, <laughs> the license is what this program and federation wants you to take. It, it could you have to be able to pull from it what you think is going to be important for you, uh, and uh, and I encourage you know like uh, it, it, we need. Uh, amateur coaches as much as we need professional coaches we need amateur coaches because you know it's not fair it's not fair sometimes I, i'm really disappointed and sad when i need to see someone 
take the reins of a, of a team and he's not comfortable with the game of soccer. He's comfortable with the game of hockey or he's comfortable with the game of baseball. Those three games are not interchangeable. As much as people think they are, they're not. There's, there, there's different skill sets across the board. There's soccer is like a chess match. It's like a, it's like a, it's like a field where you're moving pieces constantly and you need to move these pieces in the right way. And fundamental is very important, right? So, uh, so talking about that, I'm going to skip past the coaches and I'm going to go to what about your time in the impact? How did it feel to play for your hometown team, win a championship? Let us let it rip, my friend, because uh, I know that uh, you guys were the rock stars when you were winning those trophies. Look, uh, it's every kid's dream to play in their hometown, right? You always want to play in front of your mom. Uh, you always want to play in front of your dad, uh, in front of your friends, in front of your family, in front of your brother, in front of your sister. Like for me, it was always... Like I always envisioned that it was something that uh, I, I I got to do and I got to do winning. Um, when we won the championship in two thousand nine, um, it, it was special, man. It was we had a we had a special team, and you know we started a, a rocky season, and and then you know uh, Mark uh, Dos Santos just and Andrea Di Petrantonio, man. These guys, like these guys are they're, they're like even andrea like he's so like andrea is a wealth of like knowledge I would, wealth of knowledge with this no sport. honestly like uh, that's why like i i say that i had andrea as a coach when we were kids and i had him as a coach when i was a pro and i'm i'm lucky i'm lucky that i had cross paths with a guy like that because a lot of my coaching today i use a lot of things that he would use like in terms of how to speak to someone and how to you know you know take it serious like I was just, you know, I, I in, in 2009 for me, it was, um, you know, we won the championship and it, it was to win it here in Montreal. It, it was beautiful. It was just to celebrate it with, you know, my uh, my fiance at the time, with my family, with my friends, going and break our faces at night. Ah, yeah, I love it. it I was, love it. I love it. it. Breaking the face. Breaking the face. Yeah, yes. It was, uh, it was uh, we don't, I don't remember too much of it, but... Uh, <laughs> But, but it was, uh, let's say, you know what, we, we got to go to uh, City Hall, we went to uh, uh, City Hall in Quebec or whatever, whatever, the, whatever it's called. Uh, we got we got saluted in um, in the Bell Center during a Habs game. Yeah. Uh, like, these are things that, you know, like, I'm, I'm on, I'm on, I'm at the Bell Center, I'm on the ice, and I'm waving to 22,000 fans, and I'm like a little shkurnitz on the ground, on the ice, and I, I play soccer, you know, like, it's, it was, um, it was, it, it was fun, man. Like, I still go watch those videos, and it's, uh. It's definitely something I'm always gonna cherish. That's for sure, man. Okay, Rocco, I need to I need to go into this subject just because uh, of the, the the unique times that we're going in through. So, coronavirus comes as the TD of uh, of, a, of a prestigious club because looking at your club and what you've done with it, it uh, I'm gonna call it I'm gonna put it in the mm -hmm. realm of prestigious. What? did you need to do as a technical director to communicate to your your parents your teams on how soccer was going to change for the short term the medium term and the long term so uh we didn't stop uh coronavirus hit us we kept on going uh we didn't take no days off right away i hit uh, youtube live uh instagram uh facebook uh meetings like I think I've done in the last what is it ten weeks for in this this coronavirus. I think I've done maybe over two three hundred meetings. Rocco, um, you could swear you could swear on this podcast. This shit. This, yeah. this is basically shit. Yeah, this this tabernacolis. It was horrible. This shit. <laughs> but anyways, for us, it, it was it's it's very simple, Steve. How do we keep players motivated in a time like this? So what we decided to do is um, we started doing videos every single day uh, on YouTube. Um, the views are pretty good. Uh, you know, each at the beginning, of course, it, it died down a bit because people lose motivation. Um, but we started off where we're getting 800 views, 1,500 views. It was, it was amazing. It's, it's still good. It's still very good. Um, we kept in contact with all our players in the the development from u8 all the way to u21 boys and girls 
a meeting one week with the younger ones, a meeting one week with the older ones, staff meeting, parent meeting, board. Like we kept the ball rolling, and and you know what? It's 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 it was it's a lot of work. Like for me, uh, I was like saying, "This is the end, right? Now we're gonna get shut down over here." But no, in life, you, you gotta go. You gotta you gotta be creative in life. You have no choice. There's an obstacle. How do I how do I overcome this obstacle? And I think that with the, with the, with my staff and you know I have a, the, the the GM and the assistant uh, 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 administrative TD, which is Wendy and Jack. For me, if I didn't have these two, like our club wouldn't be where it is today, going through this coronavirus. You understand? It's constant communication, nonstop phone calls, emails, and you know what? Um, I'm 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 very happy. I'm uh, I'm 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 psyched to to go out there. Um, it's coming. Well, you know, I think in a couple of weeks we're going to be on the soccer field. So short term was virtual, which we're still doing. Um, then medium term is going to be phase one, which is on the field. But you know, it's practicing from social distancing, which means a player in each box from two meter to two meter boxes with a coach, and we're going to be creative on that too. And then after that, you get into a bit of contact, which is, you know, the the long term. But in terms of gameplay, I'm not going to, I don't know. But what's important, Steve, for kids' mental awareness or health is to be outside. Yes. Uh, you have kids, I have kids, and they cannot stay inside all day long. They cannot. They need to see their friends. They need to see their coaches. They, and, and it's not because I want like we right now we have to follow rules. We have to stay home, and that's it. Yes. We stay home. But once once they give us the green light to go out, we have to do it in a way where we're s- safety before anything else. And with time, it's gonna come back. You know, the, the normality will come back. But my advice to everybody that's watching is be creative and do not give up, because you giving up as a TD means you're giving up on on your your thousand kids or your two thousand kids driving your club so you gotta work your tail off to come up with ideas to keep your kids motivated yeah and that's 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 great that you mentioned your staff i'm very happy there i, I wouldn't have been able to name them off for you but i'm, I'm i i know that that you're 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 someone who's respectful for that and you know you technical director is that uh, that role in itself but there's a, there's a foundation and a group underneath you so i'm very happy that you named those people um how would you answer someone who you know like let's say myself rock you know my parents were always older my brother was 20 years older than me right so he uh, we walked around everybody thought he was my father but he was actually my brother so my parents older uh let's say someone like me my son who's six years old do I send him to to practice in this social distancing practice? Will he be able to understand social distancing at that age, or is it is it really is it really we need to as a, as a federation and as a as a club say, look, the six year olds won't understand that, the seven year olds will, the eight year olds will. Do we cap it somewhere, or or because you have to think about it in this way. Am I sending him in, to somewhere where he will he will be able to not understand what it is? Because school was going to be that problem. I'm pretty sure soccer is going to be that problem. And then what do I do after? So I said it before, it's about following the government rules, right? So for Soccer Quebec in phase one, which hopefully is at, you know in a couple of weeks, phase one is not offered to four, five, six-year-olds, unfortunately, okay. for the right reasons, yes. right? Because like you just said, to keep a six-year-old in a box and tell him to stay in that box, my son is going to run across the park and he's going to go touch every other kid that's in the park. Yep. So it's a, it's a no. It's a no. Um, but with that being said, once we get the green light that kids are able to interact, which it will come. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. But it, sh- it, it has to come. Yeah. Um, when when that comes out, then I do encourage parents to put their kids into soccer, into baseball, into whatever you want. But as soon as we get that green light for four, five, six year olds to be out and about, I recommend that we do it. 
Again, loaded question because I know you have the same age son as me and uh, my six-year-old will never stay in a box so we cannot even keep him in the house. The other time he walked to the depender by himself. Uh, <laughs> so the loaded question is this. What do you recommend a father like myself who has a six-year-old? What can I do with him while I cannot take him to practice? Go in your backyard, go to a park, get get busy man go bike riding play soccer play football play baseball uh wrestle burn burn energy get get them get them outside like i i have my kid outside every day uh he plays a lot even with my dog uh, the, he chases my dog in the yard and throws the ball it's it's they got to burn energy and you know one thing that we have to be very careful with is um don't keep kids in the house on their iPads all day long. Uh, it's about physical literacy. Forget about soccer right now. It's about a kid being active. Whether you're four years old, five years old, six year old, you got to, as a parent, it's our duty to make sure kids are busy. They got to be busy. And it's not busy by playing Xbox or by going on YouTube or it's, you know what? Take those two hours a day, an hour a day and just go outside and, and have fun. Excellent. Thank you, man. Uh, we have some questions here on the YouTube. We're going to get uh, Vince yeah. Gattuso. Vince Gattuso, let me tell you this much. He's home right now. He has a box of Kleenex. He's he's probably tears of joy that you gave him so much praise. He, he's telling, he's calling, it. he's he calling Ladia and Calabria. Why the Rocco? He said I'm the best coach in the world. This guy, Vince, not forget it, but he wants to go to a national. Vince's question mm -hmm. to you. You played in Serie A. Do you think a U21 local club has a chance against a Serie A team? Never in a million years. Never, not even a not even a, a semi-pro team. No, no, never, no chance. No chance. No chance. Serie A all the way. The next question. <laughs> Is from Stefano Gattuso. We're going to go through all the Gattuso's tonight. <laughs> <laughs> he wants to know, Rocco, have you come across any good, knowledgeable coaches who have never played the sport? Uh, Andrea Di Pretantonio. Uh, Mark Dos Santos rarely played soccer. Um, so right there is two of them off the top of my head, but in Italy, all the coaches I had played soccer, yeah. but so Mark yeah. and Andrea, basically. That's, that's amazing. That, and you, that's, it's, it's, it's fascinating because that's like, you can, you can accomplish a dream because you, if you're a student of the game and you want to invest the time to understand and teach the game. You can make it to that, that. That's professional level. Like uh, someone the, like the, Andrea. The, Andrea, I know him more because I've spoken to him, and I and I he, he called me up in a Triple A game. I was playing with the older the older players, so I need to give him this shout out. He he he's probably never going to remember this, but he called me up. We went to play in a Bitsubita Biscamang because no one wants to go play in a Bitsubita Biscamang. Or right, sure, I'll go. Steve's going to go. Hey, Rock, I scored a flying header, diving header. Hey, the people they were going crazy in a Bitsubita Biscamang. We were playing. The cows. You're the the cows. Cows. Exactly, exactly. But, so. uh, but yeah, look, he was Mark Dos, Mark Dos Santos, the guy is coaching the White Caps. I wouldn't be surprised if one day Mark Dos Santos was coaching the national team. And he played soccer, but he didn't play at the highest levels. Like he played just to play. But uh, yeah, those are perfect examples. So yeah, of course. Yeah. And Andrea, very cerebral guy, like you said, really, uh, really knows how to deliver that message. Yeah. Rocco, we're gonna go on to some fun stuff now. We're gonna take not take to not take too much more of your time there because uh, we can go to three, four hours for sure. For, we, sure, for sure, I had to. I had to touch on the you know I had to touch on the local teams because Presidente, you don't know Presidente yet there, but uh, Marcello of the Milan club uh, Montreal, he is this mythical figure who will end up contacting you. He will get your number somehow, and he will he will talk to you about this because this is his realm. He wants to know about the local sports, the kids. I touched that. I checked that off. We touched on the impact. We touched on the Canadian national team. You gave us your experiences in Europe. You gave us uh, you gave us beautiful advice on what to do during the coronavirus. What your club did beautifully during this time. Let's get down to the action here. 
let's talk about some Serie A. Serie A is back, baby, next weekend, the 20th. We're starting in Coppa Italia, which Inter is not in. But uh, anyways, oh, you know, they're in, they're in, they're in. We're going to talk, we're in, we're in. So we spoiled it, we spoiled it for everybody. Obviously, ladies and gentlemen, we have another Interist on the team. Rocco is an Interist. If, uh, if I would have to ask you, Interist player, best, your, your favorite player of Inter all time. You can't even ask that. You should know that answer. Yeah, it's the Brazilian Ronaldo. It has to be Brazilian Ronaldo. That's why I like Inter. I like Inter because of R9. That's that's what it is. And the, the, another reason why is because my dad is an Inter fan. And once he came home with, uh, it was a long time ago. I was like four or five years old. And he came home with a white sweater with the, the white and blue and the black with a snake in the middle. Yeah. And I fell in love with the logo. So I fell in love with the team. So ever, ever since then, and then when Ronaldo came about, uh, for me, there's there's nothing else. It's Inter, and for me, uh, look, it's been shit for us, but now this year, hopefully, we could, you know, make the prize. They're making some good moves. They're making some good transitions. They're, uh, I hate to talk good about Inter on the Milan Weekly Podcast, but I have no choice but to do. Um, I want to know if you had the chance – to model your game, who who would the I know because I've seen you play, but for the people that have never seen you play or have seen little of you play, who would you, who is a player that you would have modeled your game around? Like uh, my type of style. Your type of style, yeah. Politano, Insigne, like you know those little short midget players that. Uh, to just change, uh, cut on a dime, and shoot uh, from anywhere. So yeah. I would use them too. I, 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 when I watch them play, I, I look at like I'm the shittier version there, but I, I, I see myself as like, like, like them. Crafty, crafty wingers and strikers is where you modeled your game around. If, yeah. if there was a, if there was a one v one between you and Jason DiTullio, who would win? So I would probably beat him with speed because he's not he, – first of all, he has busted knees. But um, I would probably beat him with speed, but he would probably find a way on how to take me down and crack me and not even get a red card. So Good it's a – you know what? I would have I would have, I would have trouble. I would just try maybe just like try to find an angle be, before DK him just to get a shot off because I know that if I get by – Rocket, rocket left foot. We lost Rocco. We Rocco's back. <laughs> you're back. You're back. You're a bit frozen. Wait a second. Steve, say it again. Say it again. Yeah. yeah, you were a bit frozen, but you're back. You're back. We didn't say anything while you were gone. Yeah, I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. Okay. Good. good. Jason Dituyo takes you down. Beautiful. I love that. Next question for you. What happened, Phil? Phil, your brother, Phil. Fill the drill, the, yeah. Fill the drill. Is a Juventus or is an Interist? We, I don't know. He's a Juventus. What happened to Phil in your family? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, honestly, I think he's the the milk max, mil, milkman's son, or uh, I don't know because he's I don't know Juve man. I, I don't know where that came out of. Like, look again. I'm a sportive. Like I I like uh, Italian teams. Like if a team goes to a Champions League final and it's Juve or Roma or Milan. I hope they win. That's how I am. But I don't understand why he likes you. I didn't understand that. I never understood that. Uh, going on. If you had the chance to uh, to take someone off this, uh, are you following soccer regularly now? Let's say if you're able to take uh, the best qualities of the current Inter team or the, the, the current Inter players, which qualities would you take? Today? Yeah. <sighs> Look, for me, I think um, having a guy look like Lukaku up top, uh, it's and Martinez. It, like, these are guys that are just shining right now. Uh, Candreva is coming back from us, you know, from, you know, in the past couple of years, he wasn't so, you know, doing so well. But with, uh, with Conte, I, you know, he's, he's Conte's good, man. You know, it's, um, he, a coach at that level makes a big difference, and I think that going forward, they're, they're very dangerous. They play; they have an offensive style that's that's very. It's fun to watch again. Like honestly, the last five six years, 
it was atrocious. Like I couldn't watch them play anymore. I was like, what the hell? You know, like Spalletti and this guy and that guy. And, but you know, today I'm having fun today. Yeah, I'm happy you're having fun because my life sucks with Milan. They're just a Look, shambles. Look, again, I, I, uh, I'm i an Inter fan, but, you know, AC Milan, legend, legendary club. Um, crazy players went through that club. Um, what they're going through today, for me, is is, is kind of disgusting, to be honest. Um, I can't see, like, with all honesty, I can't see Milan not being in the top four. Like, it's, 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 it's kind of stupid, you know? Like, a... You're AC Milan, man. Like you can't, you can, it, it, and you know, like even their player selections. I, I don't know, man. You guys are in big trouble. If you, I, I'm sorry to tell you, like, and again, I, I love the big teams. Like I love, you know, Inter, Roma, uh, Napoli, Milan, Juve. Like you want to see these rivalries, right? But, but right now, Milan's not there, man. They're not there. No, and there's something missing and said, yeah, Milan needs to get back to uh, to to at least fixing themselves structurally. Yeah, and then on. and they're, then worry about their image. Their image is their, their image is, is is not what it used to be, man. It's not. No, and and they're losing that battle, right? They were they were living, uh, you know, as Milanista, we uh, and everybody knows we talk about it every week. We have to stop living in the past. We have to start living in the future, and unfortunately, the brand of Milan is suffering right now because it's ten years of of mixed results, right? So, yeah. um, I, I want you to uh, I want you to take some time to explain to everybody uh, about uh, Ville Saint Laurent and uh, and the and the clubs that you have and you coach and and your your uh, your achievements with that club because I think it's important for everybody listening, especially locally, to 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 know what uh, Ville Saint Laurent can offer their kids if uh, if they're in that area uh, and want to join. Look, um, Steve, when I got there in 2012, the club had uh, 800 members. It had zero AAA teams. It had 20 competitive teams. It had minimal girls playing soccer. Today, we're 2,200 members. We have uh, seven AAA teams. We have 60 competitive teams. We have higher numbers on the girls' side. Uh, we have a fantastic staff. We have a great board, uh, all workaholics. Um, it's funny you say that, you know, I have players in AAA that come and play from Toronto VI, from Quebec, from Sherbrooke, from Drummondville. Um, so I think the club in itself is uh, is uh, is a machine. It's uh, it's running really well. Um, and again, for me, like it, the door is always open for 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 anybody to come to our club. And but you know, I I do want to respect the fact that you know if you have a club that you you're that you in a zone that you live in that's good don't be afraid to be with them. You know, like it's not about kids coming to St. Laurent or kids going to RDP. It's try and trust where you're at. And if there's, if there's no good service, then yeah, you should look into going somewhere else. And for like, for like me, like I said, it's um, we, we've, we've got club. We just won club of the year this year, 2019. Every year we take a, a team or two to nationals, which, you know, nationals is, is sometimes you go once in your life. Yeah. Uh, if that. I have, I have a, yeah, I have a team that went three times. So the player went three times to nationals, three different years, you know, and uh, we never got gold. We got silvers, we got bronzes, uh, golden boots, uh, a glove, a golden glove, uh, MVPs. Like, I, I, you know what? We, I, I think personally overachieved and didn't expect uh, this much success in our club. It's not about, only about what you're winning and what you're, who you're killing and, but it's also about, you know, learning about different races, and different nationalities, and and just you know helping the ones that need help. Um, you know, there, there's there's so there's so much that goes on in our club, and and I'm just I'm very proud to be part of that club, and um, and I just you know like I said for for us our our goal is to educate coaches, develop players the best we can, boys and girls. And just, you know, show them a good pathway, not only for soccer, but in life. So, you know, teach them good values and um, good morals, good, you know, good habits, uh, good attitudes. And not only not only things. being a good not only being a good player, but actually being a good person. So that that's great. Oh, before being a good player, you got to be a good person. That's person. For sure. You spoke about the nationals there. And uh, again, uh, I have this question and just some rapid fire questions for you. And then I'm going to let you go. Uh, you spoke about the nationals and Quebec, you know, throughout my whole life, I've, I've, I've had friends that have the opportunity to go to the nationals and 
How does Quebec now st stack up against the, the other provinces? Like it was always, I've heard the the, the BCs and the, they were always the uh, BC Ontario. They would switch and swap so, who would take the gold. So Steve, they don't. Unfortunately, they don't do that anymore. Where the Quebec Select plays nationals. Okay. Now what they do is they do Quebec against Ontario, and uh, look, the the it's it's I would say almost even. Uh, but in terms of club related, like, you know, like uh, RDP or St. Laurent, when we go to nationals, it's always the same. It's always BC, Ontario, Alberta, Quebec. Those are the four provinces that, uh, that try and achieve gold. And, um, you know, BC, it's always the tall guys that are six foot, uh, 14 years old with the, the beard. And, and then you have, you know, the little, the little guys from St. Laurent come there and woo, we're going to run around you, you know? So yeah. it's, uh, you know, it, those things haven't changed. It's still the same provinces that uh, achieve. Okay. okay. Rapid fire questions. Canada, World Cup. When are we going to qualify? Um, <laughs> okay. Next question. <laughs> Look. I I we need a we need a couple more of Alfonso Davises. Uh, you know, yeah. it's uh, I think uh, uh, of course, we. Of course, I want Canada to do to be in the World Cup and do well. And but I think today, like today, we're not there yet. Today, best game, best game you ever played in Europe or in in uh, in Montreal. Like my 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 best ever performance in one game, ninety minutes. Yep. Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, oh my God, I would say. Um, Italy, I was with a team called uh, Gualdo, and uh, we played against uh, Benevento, which was in first place at the time. And we went there, and we we had four fans in the stands. They had all kinds of fans in the stands, and we won three one. And I scored two goals and uh, got an assist on the third goal, and just had a phenomenal game. It was just my day. I want to know. Rocco Placentino sits down. Your lovely wife or yourself, I'm not going to be sexist here, made dinner. We're eating pasta tonight, Rocco. The penne in your pasta, are they penne lisce or penne rigate? So, um, first of all, I cook. So they're going to be penne rigate. Si! And, uh, and it's gonna be with a lot of uh, parmesan on it. Good job. <laughs> Only the Tulio's a penelish. It's like he's eating uh, he's eating goldfish. But Jason the Tulio, he can't even cook. He told me he goes, "Does he know how to make hot dogs?" I'm not, I'm not surprised. <laughs> I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. Next question for you is: What does Rocco want to do after TD? TD. 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 Rocco, I want to thank you very, very much. I've taken up an hour and two minutes of your time. Plus, I called you this morning. Plus, I've been smashing you on Instagram and text. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. For taking the time. And uh, for everybody who was on here live, we will, as always, take this and, uh, and turn it into a podcast and tweet it out and tag you and make sure that uh, everybody listens to this locally and abroad and that uh, we put uh, Rocco Placentino where he belongs and doing a fantastic job as the technical director for uh, Club de Soccer saint Lara. Thank you, Rocco. Thank you. No, thank you, Steve. Uh, I appreciate it. It was, uh, it was good to, to... I like having this chat, so thank you very much for inviting me. Amazing. Have a good one, everybody. E ovunque e sempre... I'm going to say it even though Rocco's here. Forza Milan. It's okay. Rightfully so. <laughs>